make sure to give my dad a five star review. Get, make sure to like and subscribe to his YouTube. Thank, thank you for listening and enjoy the, the show. show. <laughs> Why is it that Christianity seems impotent to deal radically and therefore effectively with the issues of discrimination and injustice on the basis of race, religion, and national origin? Is this impotency due to a betrayal of the genius of the religion, or is it the basic weakness of the religion itself? So he's asking this question I think many of us have wondered. When it comes to fighting racism, is there something wrong with Christianity? Is there something inherent to the religion? Because it so often seems like it's part of the problem, like Christians are part of the problem. So Thurman ultimately comes down on the position of, you know, this pro-slavery, pro-segregation, pro-white supremacy Christianity isn't the true faith. And to the extent that people call themselves Christians and practice those things, it is a betrayal of what he calls the genius of the religion. I tend to agree. Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and watchers. If you're watching our YouTube channel, I'm your political host, Will Wright. And I am joined by your faithful host, Pastor Josh Bertram. Welcome, Josh. Thank you, Will. And uh, we're joined this week uh, by someone I have been wanting to speak with for a very, very long time since I first read his book, The Color of Compromise, and then read his other book, How to Fight Racism. And he's here to talk to us about another book called The Spirit of Justice. But this person is Jamar Tisby. Um, and I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of who this person is in case you have been living under a rock. Um, he is the founder of The Witness, a black Christian collective where he writes about race, religion, politics, and culture. He's also the co-host of Pass the Mic podcast. He's spoken nationwide at conferences, and his writing has been featured in a whole bunch of publications, New York Times, The Atlantic, CNN. And he was in a uh, recent documentary about Christian nationalism as well. I want to start first by just asking um, about, like, why, why are folks like yourself and the books that you write so important to our national conversation about faith and politics um, today, and and it, and especially the fact that you're a black theologian, um, and we just we just don't have enough of those. I don't think. Well, I appreciate that. Yes, I I do dip into the theological register uh, every once in a while. I did get my master's of divinity. Thought I was going to be a pastor, and uh, God had other plans for me. But I do feel like some of my ministry is pastoral in a way, uh, just beyond the, the, the church walls. Um, I mean, to, to your question, gosh, we need to learn our history. <laughs> we need to learn so much more of our history, especially Christians um, who oftentimes really get very little or one-sided. Uh, that's really a national problem in many ways. But I have just been astounded by the real, true human stories. And, and one of the things I love about history is people can say they believe whatever they want, but history has the receipts. Because history is a record of people's actions. And how you act actually betrays what you truly believe. So I just think it's incredibly revealing for us in good and bad ways. And so in this book, The Spirit of Justice, I think it's in one of those good ways where we can look at people of faith who, because of their faith, found ways to resist racism and fight for justice, no matter what the odds or the obstacles. And I think we can be inspired by their example. I love that. You know, I, I would love to ask you as a historian and theologian, Kind of a, a method question because, you know, you're studying people from the past, you're studying what they do and their actions, right? Uh, of course, reveals so much about what they believe. But how how do we study from people from the past uh, when it comes to something like racism or anti-racism? How do we how do we see them in their own context and judge them fairly according to the standards of their day, not necessarily ours? What, what kind of, how was that process for you and and how do you like what uh, advice do you have for people like me just the, the normal person that maybe doesn't have all the training to try to 
um, do that well. I often hear people say, well, you know, you, you can't, it's not fair to look at historical figures and judge them according to the morality or the standards of our day. To which I say, you know, you asked, how do we approach this theologically and historically? If you are a person of faith, if you're a Christian, then our standards for right and wrong, righteousness and unrighteousness, justice and injustice, they don't change. <laughs> they're, mm. they're given to us by the creator. And so it doesn't matter what time period you're looking at. Right is right and wrong is wrong. Justice is justice. Injustice is injustice. So I think we can bring that and ought to, as people of faith, to the historical record. Um, another objection I often hear is well, they were just men of their time, particularly talking about slaveholders, segregationists, right, right, people right. doing bad stuff. They're saying, well, they were just men of their time. And what's so interesting is during slavery, there were also abolitionists. And there were also people who uh, worked against segregation. They were people of their time, too. So it's not sufficient to say, well, they were just sort of in the spirit of their age. Everybody was doing it. Everybody was not doing it. And so how do you account for the people who saw in that same time period that what was happening was unjust? So those are a couple of ways that I think about it theologically and historically. So in, in your book, The Spirit of Justice, um, you know, you are bringing to light stories of, you know, unsung heroes, people who resisted racism, folks, I, I mean, if I'm being honest, had no idea existed and what they actually did. So what, what motivated you to, one, write this book? Um, and two, why did you choose the, the folks that you included in the book? Yeah, so Will, you're getting at something that is extremely important, which is like we don't hear this is a term I heard in grad school that has stuck with me. We have an impressionistic view of history, meaning we have general impressions of stuff that happened. You know, there was this civil war, there was an American Revolution, there was a civil rights movement. We may know a couple names here and there, but when it comes to the specifics, we really aren't that well informed. And so I think there's actually a power to learning history in its specificity. So in learning the names and the dates and the places, but, but more than that, the real life, true human struggles of it, of, of people. So there's a certain power in that too, which is my, that's my sort of commercial for people to go out and, and go study history more. And trust me, I don't, I don't know what your background was in school, whether you loved it or hated history, but it is really interesting. I, you, you, you revisit it, revisit it, give it another chance. Everybody deserves a second chance. So does history, right? Um, and you asked about like why I wrote this book. There's this really powerful quote by Howard Thurman in his incredible book, Jesus and the Disinherited. Howard Thurman's a theologian, almost a Christian mystic, uh, black man who, who lived uh, before and during the civil rights movement. And um, he says this in the, the introduction or preface to that book, Jesus and the Disinherited. Why is it that Christianity, Christianity seems impotent to deal radically and therefore effectively with the issues of discrimination and injustice on the basis of race, religion, and national origin, is this impotency due to a betrayal of the genius of the religion, or is it the basic weakness of the religion itself? So he's asking this question I think many of us have wondered. When it comes to fighting racism, is there something wrong with Christianity? Is there something inherent to the religion? Because it so often seems like it's part of the problem, like Christians yeah. are part of the problem. So. Thurman ultimately comes down on uh, uh, the position of, you know, this pro-slavery, pro-segregation, pro-white supremacy Christianity isn't the true faith. And, and to the extent that people call themselves Christians and practice those things, it is a betrayal of what he calls the genius of the religion. I tend to agree. And I wrote this book, The Spirit of Justice, to give us those examples. We don't just have to say it. We can prove it because there's another side to the story. There's the side of white Christian complicity with racism, but there's also the side of 
Black Christians courageously confronting racism. So I wanted to tell that story too. That's really good. And I, I love your comment about history. I have recently gotten into the study and understanding of history, even more trying to understand how we can even study the past and make inferences from the past into the present. And it's so important to look at these things because we deal with stuff that has been dealt with and people have had to deal with human nature, right? For as long as we've been around and they've worked through that and we can learn from them. And I, I, I just love that. And that quote that you just gave is so powerful. Mm -hmm. So powerful. Mm -hmm. It's, it's absolutely you. amazing. Too. It's so good. And, 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 you know, you highlight these individuals like Robert Smalls, Jarena Lee, and what they used and how they use their faith to fuel their resistance. How did their spiritual convictions drive their actions in the fight against racism? And what kind of lessons can we learn today from what they did? They confronted injustice. They stood up for right when everything was wrong. So Jarena Lee was the first woman authorized to preach in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She went to Richard Allen, the first bishop of the AME, and said she felt a call to preach. He said, no, we don't do that. He authorized her to essentially be, you know, a Sunday school teacher, and she was able to teach in various ways. But then there's this really dramatic event years later where she still felt that call. Somebody was actually in the pulpit preaching and the preacher apparently lost his thread, just started stumbling. She actually <laughs> goes, interrupts the service, basically, you know, sh shuffles this guy out of the pulpit and says, I'll take over and starts <laughs> preaching. And then like nice. church just goes on. And then afterwards, Richard Allen, who had originally said, no, you can't preach. We don't let women preach was like, I was wrong. <laughs> like, she's got the gift. This was amazing. And so she's authorized to preach. And then since this is uh, the Faithful Politics podcast, I think it's important to talk about people like Robert Smalls, who was born enslaved and has a, a life that is made for a movie. He escaped by stealing a Confederate ship that he was enslaved to work on. Mm. He noticed that the, the white sailors would, would leave the ship at night and just leave the, the black people who worked on the ship on the ship, unattended, just trusting that they wouldn't try to run away under penalty of cruelty or death. But Robert Smalls hatches this plan, steals the ship at night, rides it through, steers it through um, a Union blockade, which, understand, all the Union saw was a Confederate ship. So he was taking a big old risk because they could have fired on sight. But he raises the white flag. They come aboard, sees all these black people because he brings his family and other people with him. And then the, the, the incredible part of the story is not only does he escape to freedom, like the plan works, but also he joins up with the Union Navy. Eventually, he becomes captain of his own ship, the very same ship that he stole from the Confederates. And then wow. he becomes this well-renowned speaker because the, the story was astounding even back in his day, right, during the Civil War. So he, he becomes a speaker. He makes this money. He buys a home. It's the very home of the person who once enslaved him. So talk about a redemption story, right? Uh, now wow. the enslaved has become the owner of the house. But that's not all. Robert Smalls and so many of these figures in the spirit of justice feel this burden to serve. And the way Smalls does it is he runs for government, runs for elected office, and becomes uh, an elected official. And this horrific turn of events during the late 19th century, when wh white people are trying to take back the South for white supremacy, this period called redemption, they craft all these lies and rumors about him and basically say he's unfit for office and kick him out of office and all the black people. And then they usher in this period during uh, the Jim Crow era of horrific political repression. And so you're asking, you know, how do they actively build this? Like they're, they're confronting evil and confronting injustice, but they're also getting involved politically. Um, and there's so many figures in this book whose work involved policy, politics, if not elected office. Robert Smalls is one great example. I, I feel like the um, Robert Smalls, maybe I'm, I'm making this up, but um, there's a thing on Netflix with Kevin Hart and he's like teaching his kids about <laughs> yeah. like, like <laughs> and I've seen for, it, yeah. for some reason there's this image and I, I don't, is, is it, is that the same, is that the same Robert Smalls that, 
uh, that so you know? I remember he he talks about John Punch and uh, shipping himself in a box. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Harder, I remember that. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I, to my recollection, it is the same Robert Small. <laughs> that's that's so wild. Uh, yeah, th- there's another story in your book that that I I thought would be um, interesting to have you um, tell us about, um, and it's one I think that a lot of people have have heard and what was, what was the term you used impressionistic mm-hmm. like Maybe view of history, of history. Exactly. um and i think that, that, that this will be a good one so like the 40 acres and a mule oh, uh, yeah. and, and the um oh. and that can, can, can well, you, can this you, is so on? good yeah so 40 acres and a mule is the sort of historical landmark we have for an attempt at some sort of reparations, some sort of um, material compensation to recently freed black people. You know, many people said uh, black people were um, freed from the chains of slavery, but shackled into the chains of poverty afterwards because they emancipated all these people but didn't give them anything and understand it's not really even giving. This is about justice. This is about just recompense and earnings because fundamentally what slavery was, wasn't about you, icky black people, they got dark skin. No, that was, that was something else that came along to support the fundamental issue, which was labor exploitation. So what slavery was about was free labor so that the plantation owners could increase their bottom line by not paying the laborers, right? So then you get emancipation all these black people freed at the cost of the civil war, by the way, this isn't just happen. Hundreds of thousands of people died in this conflagration. And then they're left penniless. So 40 acres and a mule was something that happened while the civil war was still going on toward the end of it. Uh, basically white union leaders are like, well, what do we do with all these quote unquote contraband? Uh, these were, uh, uh, black people who escaped across union lines to freedom. And, um, so, they there's a christian part in here because as they're trying to figure this out they gather a group of black ministers black ministers are seen as the the leaders broadly in the community not just religious leaders because often these are the most educated they have uh respect they are shepherding people they're community leaders so they they bring up bring together this group of community leaders who are all black male ministers and they ask them hey what what can we do what what do you want and it's so interesting. These people who've been enslaved themselves personally, but also for hundreds of years, they don't say, you know, we want to get revenge against our oppressors. They don't say um, we want to form our own country and have our own army and never deal with y'all white folks again. They said, give us our own land so that we can farm it, and sustain life for our families to make a little money. Give us 40 acres. And then later came along the the idea of a mule to help drag the plow so that they could plant. And it was black ministers, it was black Christians who had the key role in saying, listen, we don't want a handout. We're not even asking for back pay. Just give us an opportunity to work for ourselves, to to sustain ourselves, and we'll be fine. That is, that's fascinating, man. I love hearing how, you know, the uh, ministers were number one, leaders they were acknowledged as leaders because that's what they were and they were also so practical in what they were doing in the community you know it wasn't just preaching right which you get this idea of ministers is just preaching but it was so much f- more than that in shaping the community and i think that's really amazing you know i know that the history of African Americans, the history of uh, you know our United States and its complicity in racism and slavery and the church has been interpreted in various ways. It's been used in various ways for ill or for good. It's also been uh, changed many times. Uh, people have uh, tried to take things away or or erase things or or tried to give a different narrative. Um, how do you hope that your book, The Spirit of Justice, contributes to the preservation of Black history? And uh, why is this so important, reclaiming this and these narratives so crucial and important for the future of our nation and, uh, in particular, uh, race relations? My burden is that the church would know history. And I mean that burden, like it feels like a heavy mm. weight. That, and, and, and like the Bible says, a fire shut up in your bones, right? So I think 
that as much as we study the Bible, as much as we hear the word preached, the Bible has a historical context that adds so much richness and depth to our understanding of God speaking to us through the pages of Scripture. Well, guess what? Our, our nation and our society has a context as well. Uh, one of the things historians say is everything has a history. What got me involved um, in an academic way in history was I'm looking at Ferguson and the killing of Mike Brown, and I'm asking questions. Why, did, why does this spark such a reaction among the black community, right? Why, why is it that people who've never even heard of Ferguson can identify with that community? And then I start learning about redlining and residential segregation. And then I talk about why, I start to think about why is there this, this sort of at odds nature between law enforcement and black individuals and black communities. And then I start studying the origins of some of modern day policing being rooted in slave controls and the control of black bodies after emancipation, right? And to me, history just unlocks so much of this. And the reason why people are trying to suppress history is because it is dangerous. It is subversive. Uh, Josh, you study too much history, you're going to become a progressive. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because, because, because what's happening is, here's, here's, here's my take. Tell me what you think. If you study um, bipartisan politics, particularly at the federal level, there's strategies each party uses to gain votes. In general, there's a party that looks to the past and says we need to recover something we lost. And there's a party that looks to the future and says we need to move forward toward progress. A party that appeals to the past and a party that appeals to progress. When it comes to race, this is what I say in my second book, How to Fight Racism. What do you want to conserve historically? What do you want to conserve? That's a great so question. Then, you know, if you don't, you know, if you don't want to conserve the slavery, nobody wants to do that, right? If you don't want to conserve the segregation, if you don't want to conserve people not being able to get certain jobs or live in certain neighborhoods, whatever, if you're not trying to conserve that, our, our racial past in terms of bringing it back, then guess what? Your default of progressive. Because you're saying you want to move forward, mm. so sorry. <laughs> you know, dude, I I just have one quick comment on that. I I totally hear you because I, I I think that kind of has happened. I mean, I still very much feel conservative theologically and all that stuff. But one of the realities is, you know, the whole the old phrase "Make America Great Again." I never even thought about that, and then I thought, well, it just hit me because I've been studying so much history and thinking, well, great again for who? And yeah, so, exactly. I was like, exactly. Make it great again for who? That, that's a really important question. Who is it making it great again for? Um, and I just thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, th the other thing, Jamar, is um, I do. Does any of this stuff get taught in Bible college seminary? Anything? No. Like that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's and, and I'll, I'll I'll tell you why I asked the question, and and Josh already answered it. Uh, but it's it's I was having a conversation with um, a pastor friend relative. Actually, he's my brother in law, and uh, we were talking about you know, like the doctrine of discovery or, mm -hmm. you know, like the Negro Bible, you know, or like, hold on, I've, I've got a, I've got a book sitting right here on my shelf. I just, um, it's, it's, a uh, how to make a Negro Christian. Uh, <laughs> wow. And, and it seems like if you are, you know, a Christian and you're going into a missionary field, one of the things you would do is to learn about the culture, learn about the history. You know, if I'm going to go do be a missionary in, you know, Pakistan, like there are some things I want to make sure I, I go to that country knowing, mm -hmm. understanding culture, mannerism stuff, you know. So yeah. but, but it doesn't seem like Christians really kind of have that level of preparedness, you know, to work just the American mission field. So, so I, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. It was always so selective. So for instance, we, we know by now that the Southern Baptists split in 1845 over the issue of slavery. But one of the things I talk about in my first book, Color Compromise, is, is, is the exact contours 
of the split. So let's move beyond the impressionistic view of history. The exact issue was could a missionary in good, be in good standing and enslave people? And so let's think about the implications of that. You have this white person from the United States going overseas, likely to a country populated by black or brown folks, wanting to preach the gospel. Meanwhile, enslaving those very same kind of people in the United States and that dissonance, mm. right? Like, like how can you, how can you, and being a missionary is a big sacrifice, right? Like you're leaving family, yeah. you're, you're, you're risking life, all of that stuff. How can you be so dedicated, so devoted to spreading the gospel among these different people and then right in your own backyard, right in your own household, not see the full humanity of people who look probably just like the ones you're going to serve, right? So that's always been the case. And and it's, you know, it's that you can probably speak to this theologically. There's something in our, you know, selfish human nature, human um, proclivities that, that wants to absolve ourselves, uh, that, that turns a blind eye to our own sin and the, our own ways of dehumanizing people, um, paints it in the most positive light, and allows us still to go do potentially good things, right? Like I talked about in Georgia, how uh, during during the um, set, a foregone conclusion in Georgia, it was originally founded as a free state, mm. but um, there was this Christian who enslaved people, uh, didn't want to originally, but then was persuaded because he had um, some land needed to farm it, needed to turn a profit, and used enslaved labor to do it. And part of that money went to support an orphanage, ostensibly a good cause, right? But that's, that's the, the sort of convoluted ways that, that we bend and contort ourselves in order to justify injustice. I don't have a great, satisfying answer. It's really confounding when you look at the historical record, and even people today, right? But it, I think, humbly, we should all be aware that we can be capable of incredible hypocrisy and a blindness to that same hypocrisy. Yeah, that's really, really good. You know, one of the things that you cover in your writings and in this book and, and uh, specifically is you kind of examine the cost of resisting slavery, not slavery, but racism. Obviously, slavery was racism. Um, but what speak to us a little bit about the personal sacrifices that people made and how we can honor their legacy? And also, what does that cost today? How can we learn from the cost of resisting racism in the past and understand what it's going to cost us today? Like Jesus says, count the cost, right, as we move into it. What, what do you think? The book, The Spirit of Justice, focuses on Black Christians. They're by far the majority, but I do talk about some white folks who uh, stood up against racism and at great cost. So in the introduction, I talk about Charles Morgan Jr. I loved writing this part because it's a throwback to my first book, The Color of Compromise. Charles Morgan Jr. is a white lawyer in Birmingham. And the day after the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing where four little girls are killed, he gets in front of a group of all white businessmen and says, who did it? Who threw that bomb? And he answers mm. his own question. He says, the answer should be, we all did it. What he's getting at there is this idea of compromise that all these guys in the room, none of them planted the dynamite. But by not speaking up, by not taking active action against racism, they had basically created a, a context for a bombing like this to occur. What I didn't say in The Color of Compromise is what happened next. So within 24 hours, um, Charles Morgan Jr. is getting threatening phone calls. Uh, he receives a letter with a, a list of all the places his wife and son had been on their daily errands to sort of convey the message, hey, we're watching you and your family. And basically, he gets run out of town. And I think one of the tragic details of history, again, moving beyond an impressionistic view of history, they, the, their son had to give away their two family dogs. Now, I don't know if y'all are pet owners, but it is absolutely devastating to lose a pet and then to have to give them away because racists are running you out of town. What a horrible reason, right? And 
he's also so so that's a demonstration of the cost. Like he never could live in his hometown again, simply because he gave a speech. Like this is not some dude out boycotting, rallying, protesting, whatever. He gave a speech that intimated, "Hey, white folks, we may have some responsibility here to address racism," and that was enough. So I do think it, it, it is irresponsible. Uh, in, for me to tell people or encourage people to get involved in the struggle for racial justice without giving them some sense of the costliness and allowing people simply to count the cost. So in this, in this deeply researched book, you profile a lot of folks that I, I wish I had known about you know, earlier in my life um, in high school and or college. But I, I get the sense that there were probably uh, double the amount of people um, that you researched that didn't make it into the book. And I'd love to just get get a few of, of the folks that, you know, unfortunately, um, your editor said, hey, this book is already too long. And we need to <laughs> cut this thing. So like, so what are who, who are some of those people? It's a fun and frustrating question. Um, this book is my longest book by maybe a couple dozen pages. And so it, it was ironic because in approaching this conceptually, I was like, am I going to be able to find enough people <laughs> who like stood up against racism to fill a whole book? Uh, because the, the story on the other side is much more copious. But the great news was not only could I find enough, there were more than enough. And so a little bit of my grid for selecting the people I did one, uh, they had to have some sort of demonstrable stance against racism, be that big or small. Um, but two, I also wanted to explicitly tie their actions to their faith. And so part of the reason maybe someone made it in the book or didn't was I wanted to have some sort of historical record that spoke to their faith. And not everybody had that. It doesn't mean it wasn't there, but that it wasn't written or recorded or something like that. So that was part of the grid. I wish I could have written about, you know, Howard Thurman, for one example. Um, another example is uh, Tom Skinner, uh, Black evangelical in the 1970s, or Bill Pinnell, his, his colleague. Uh, there were a lot of f folks who I didn't write about because there's other great work about them. So Fannie Lou Hamer is one of my historical heroes. She doesn't have her own subsection here because I talk about her in my second book, How to Fight Racism. And there's also a great recent biography of Fannie Lou Hamer called Until I Am Free by Keisha Blaine. So if you could find it elsewhere pretty easily, maybe they didn't make the cut in this book, but it doesn't mean they weren't significant and important. Yeah, that's that's really good. You know, in the context of your book, the part of the point that you make, and I, I think it's really uh, well made, and is that faith is not just a personal belief, but is a source of resilience and activism. Like faith is something that actually isn't just about what we think about, you know, or where we go to church and what our personal beliefs are, that it should essentially materialize in some kind of real action and activity in our life that's promoting justice, right? Mm -hmm. so how do you see the role of faith evolving in our current racial justice movements, um, especially in the face of growing challenges? Seems like, uh, again, racism has come to uh, the four, we didn't have as much progress as we thought we had. And uh, at least that that was my sentiment. That was my feeling when, uh, you know, in the last five, 10 years. And I would just love because one of my one of my hypotheses, one of the, my theories, maybe, is that, you know, because of the church's uh, resistance to um, really tackle racism, we've our witness has been has been uh, destroyed in many ways and many people especially younger generations minds has been destroyed i think it's a huge part and i don't have a lot of evidence to back that maybe you do from your research but it, it's just it's been a travesty um and young christians are leaving probably because they just think hypocrisy and we're not salt and light we don't preserve anything we don't have moral authority uh, we say one thing and and yet we're not willing to confront others. Um, 
what do you feel like, how do you feel like faith today, in light of what you've written about, how, how should it push us forward? And even just address some of the things that I've, that I've just mentioned. So I, I agree with your hypothesis that uh, our, our, our lack of a public witness for justice as the church has, has turned some people off from the church. There's recent data from the Public Religion Research Institute. They surveyed half a million people to get uh, religious demographics today. And uh, the religiously unaffiliated, or the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, are now more than a quarter of the population. And as a group, the, the nuns outnumber Catholics, mainlines, or evangelicals um, singly. Uh, combined, they're a bigger group. But uh, and you take any one of those specific groups, and the nuns are a bigger group than that. So the landscape for ministry has to contend with that. And by the way, religiously unaffiliated means just that. It just means they don't claim a particular tradition or institutional home. But the number of agnostics and atheists has remained relatively the same. So it's not that people aren't believing in a higher power at all. Is that they don't want to be associated with these churches and traditions that have done such a horrible job, whether it's through sexual abuse scandals or abuses of power and narcissism, or yes, as you say, a failure to confront racism. Uh, I have countless stories of regular everyday churchgoers who there would be some horrific cell phone video of a black person being brutalized by law enforcement or vigilantes and not a whisper of it in church that next Sunday, um, not in the prayers, certainly not in the sermon. And that silence spoke volumes to people. So I think what we need to do, what folks like you need to do, or who are in church leadership, think about how you want you and your congregation to be remembered. What do you want the history books to say about you? I say that because maybe if we think in terms of a legacy, we get a little bit more boldness. And I think that's what's lacking. I think a lot of times in the church, we want to be in the middle so that we can speak to all people. I think there's some virtue to that. Uh, I was speaking with another pastor and I said, maybe instead of thinking of the church as the middle, maybe the church is the meeting ground. And at that meeting ground, we can have an honest dialogue. But, but truly, actually, when it comes to justice being the, in the middle, not only doesn't help, it typically helps the oppressor, right? Uh, that's what Eli Wiesel, a Holocaust survivor, says. Neutrality never helps the oppressed, only the oppressor. And so I don't think, I think, I think church leaders should, should wrestle with what neutrality means in situations of injustice. I think they should wrestle with what it means to sit in the middle when there are oppressed. And by the way, people will call that woke language or critical race. The Bible uses the language of oppressed and oppressed, right? And I think we should think about this concept that I talk about a lot. Justice takes sides. But then how can the church be a meeting place where people can say, come let us reason together and let us, you know, not pound people over the head with our views, but carry out to its logical conclusion what we do believe because of our faith and go forth and act accordingly. So there's not a super satisfying answer that ain't controversial. The last thing I'll say around this is for people who are timid, read the history and learn about the black church tradition. Because a lot of what sounds radical or confrontational or extreme is actually very in line with the historical black church tradition. But what's happening is there's an absolute ignorance on the side of many of what the black church is like. They've never worshipped in a black church, much less um, really been discipled by black Christian leaders who understand being from a historically marginalized group and have come to the Bible with those questions and those priorities. Therefore, the preaching is different. Therefore, the songs are different. Therefore, the topics are different and the applications are different. And if you haven't had that exposure to other Christians following Jesus out of their context, then it's going to be very hard to take a public, bold stance for justice because you've never been exposed to it uh, uh, and seen how Christians can do that. Yeah, that's, um, that's really, really... Um, deep. And I, I, 
I, I was thinking j- just about you, you had mentioned the PRI survey. Um, there's something else in the survey that I just thought was absolutely fascinating. How the the decline, you know, or the the drop in affiliation was much more prevalent in like the white evangelical Protestant category um, versus, I mean, basically any. <laughs> any other sort of like denomination and and it like they're saying you know it dropped maybe less than a point or something for like the black church and and i i bet we could probably do a whole episode about why that is but um <laughs> but i uh, yes uh, uh, I, uh, well just, it's it's because of what josh was bringing up it's it's the hypocrisy people see or perceive um particularly in the white evangelical space trumpism has a lot to do with that for people um, in politics in general, but also, like I said, uh, the treatment of women, sexual abuse, a lot of people looking at LGBT plus issues, treatment of racial, racial issues. It's a whole complex of those things. But yeah, and, and, and to your point, Will, I remember being in churches and seminaries late 2000s, early 2010s, and the, 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 the line was evangelical churches will do nothing but grow because we have a very firm and clear doctrinal stance. And these other churches, these mainline Protestant churches that are wishy-washy about doctrine, wishy-washy about the Bible, they're going to go away because what people really want is, you know, hard-hitting truth, boundaries, something they can latch on to. Well, actually, the opposite has proven true. Mainline numbers have remained relatively stable over the past 10, 15 years, but the the numbers of white evangelicals have, have dropped precipitously. And um, maybe, it's, I'm not up here arguing we shouldn't have doctrine or, or clear standards. I'm just saying that some of that rigidity that people looked to as a positive good and that was going to ensure the growth and the health of the church, actually, maybe that doctrine wasn't that healthy. Or maybe at least the way you held it wasn't that healthy. And now we're seeing it with the numbers of people walking away from these churches. Yeah. So my my last question um, for you, you know, we've talked about the past, spirit of justice. Um, we're in 2024. There's an election coming up. Um, I know there's a there's a movement that that you're a part of evangelicals for Harris. Like, are are we at a moment in history where you know, potentially we could see sort of, um, I don't know what the right word is, like a rise and, you know, evangelicals kind of going back to, to, to their roots to, <laughs> to kind of push for some of this social change, you know, making sure that people are being seen just like Jesus uh, sees folks. What's revolutionary potentially about this moment is white folks changing their political allegiances. When you think of evangelicals, you think of white. And that has been coded as white since at least the post-World War II era. And there's an argument to be made, and some historians are beginning to make it, that evangelicalism as we now know it is more of a socio-political movement than a theological, ecclesiastical one. Um, so with Evangelicals for Harris, um, I introduce myself by saying I'm a Christian for democracy. And that's what I think is at stake here. And, you know, other people disagree, but uh, I think with January 6th, Project 2025, other things, um, that there's a very real possibility that our votes won't mean the same thing or count the same if, if it goes a certain way. So I said I'm a Christian for democracy. and you know, we caught heck, we caught holy heck for being on that Zoom call. And the mere intimation that you could be a Christian and vote Democratic, right? Because, you know, at least since the rise of the moral majority and the religious right in the late 70s, people have been discipled for decades to say the only true Christian way to vote is Republican. And now you're coming and saying, not only are you not going to vote Republican, you're not voting third party or abstaining, you're voting for a Democrat. Not only are you voting for a Democrat, you're voting for a person of color. Not only are you voting for a person of color, you're voting for a woman. Like Checking all those know, boxes, you know? These are, you know, the, the all of the, the, the elements of the apocalypse right Just here. Busting the gates of hell wide open, you know? <laughs> exactly. Um, horsemen, what's dude. really happening... Exactly. Um, and what's really happening here is this is not anything that is out of the norm for the black political theological tradition. As I said, there's people like Robert Smalls. There's people like Shirley Chisholm who paved the way 
for Kamala Harris because Chisholm back in 72 declared her candidacy for the Republican nomination or the Democratic nomination for president as a black woman and a staunch Christian, right? So there's all these folks saying you can't be Christian and vote Democratic. I was like, well, what about all the black Christians? Because black people overwhelmingly vote Democratic and are one of the most religious uh, demographics in the country, mostly Christian. So are you, are you literally going to dismiss all of the black Christians who vote Democratic? So I say, you know, this is really about white people changing their votes and, and potentially voting for Harris. That's what I mean, because it's not out of the norm for black Christians to vote Democratic um, in these modern times. It is out of the norm for white evangelicals to vote anything other than Republican. And that's what's got folks on the far right really rattled. And that it really is the conversation point for a lot of people. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I was thinking they're probably like freaking out like, man, we're we're losing our hold on the, uh, you know, the white Christian vote or whatever. And that it doesn't bode well. I'm sure if they if they're feeling that they're they're and now Taylor not, Swift uh, endorsed. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! I know. It's all over now. T Swift, <laughs> Tay Tay. My girls last night, and this is the last thing I'll say. And then I just have a practical question. My girls last night, we were watching the debate, and I haven't like uh, said I'm voting for either one of the candidates that are up there. And um, they were like. I don't want the angry man to win. I want the girl to win. I want the girl to win. And like my five-year-old is saying all this stuff. They're like, did she win? Did she win? I'm like, baby, I, they, we haven't voted yet. <laughs> it was just funny, dude. From I'm like, miles all right. of babes. That's so funny because my uh, junior high schooler had the same impression. Um, he wanted to stay up late. So he was like, can I watch the debate with you? Yeah. And so uh, he was just like, Trump just seems mad. <laughs> like, you know. Yeah, I think he did get pretty mad at a few a few times there. But Jamar, yes, thank yes. you so much for being on the show with yeah, us. How can people you. get the book and how can they follow your work? And what do you have coming down the pike? Well, y'all, thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for, you know, talking about this from a faith perspective, talking about politics, because I think we need more of that, not less. Um Folks can get the books wherever you get your books. Support your local bookstore if you'd like. And um, since books take a really long time to write, like years, if you'd like to keep up with my writing in between, I would love it if you subscribe to my Substack. Mm -hmm. I describe it as a newsletter on steroids, <laughs> a lot of functionality. But I write there frequently at Jamar Tisby dot substack.com you can subscribe for free or you can support my work by being a paid subscriber at jamartisby.substack.com and i'm on all the socials at jamartisby um yes i'm literally working on the next book manuscript now Jeez. can't say much about it but uh there's it's already in the works so more to come your, your, your substack wait. is your substack is excellent i i i read it every time it um i get Man, an email thank you will uh, so Kudos. That's, that's yeah, right. and we will definitely put all that into the show notes and would love to have you on again to talk about your new book when it comes out, whatever that Thank is. You. Thank yes. you, Jamar. Really appreciate all your work. Likewise. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And to our viewers and listeners, thank you so much for joining us. And make sure until next time, keep your conversations not right or left, but up. Take care, guys. Hey there, Josh Bertram here, faithful host of the Faithful Politics Podcast. I want to let you know about a compelling new spinoff, the Faith Roundtable, where I'll be interviewing top faith leaders, theologians, and scholars to unpack the pressing issues that are shaping the church in America today. We'll dive into topics like faith and public life, social justice, and how we can engage our communities more effectively. Make sure you don't miss any of our enlightening conversations by subscribing to it on our YouTube channel. Join me at the Faith Roundtable, where deep discussion meets thoughtful insight.